period between returning from Beagle Voyage and then his marriage, Darwin wrote several interesting books on aesthetics, most notably Burke's <coughs> philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, uh, but also works of uh, Archibald Allison, Stuart, Hanhold, Smile, Wordsworth's poetry, etc. And altogether interesting combination of texts of empirically based British aesthetics of the uh, second half of the 18th century works <coughs> and contemporary physiologically oriented theories, for example, Mile uh, and sometimes other ones. So it is evident that Portman and Darwin use very different terminology. From the point of view of philosophical aesthetics, both terminologies are too broad and sometimes bad. But thanks to their experience and knowledge, both Portman and Darwin are quite familiar with what they are talking about and their approaches are part of a wider, more thoughtful context in comparison with many contemporary scientists and biologists. Mm. So, chapter one. The function and appearance of living beings. Among the topics associated with the aesthetic dimension in the work of both naturalists, I would point out the problem of the usefulness and appearance of living beings. This theme is crucial, especially for Portman, who literally focuses on it throughout his entire work. <coughs> uh, but Girka will talk about it more, so we will see. Uh, uh, so I will just re-emphasize this sometimes, associated these topics with the field of aesthetics. Maybe of the greatest significance is when uh, Portman allies with our current thinking in the article Biologists to Aestheticians at Zoom, published in Biology and Guys. Our thinking, despite Portman, is mainly concerned with the function and utilitarian structures and explanations arising from the overwhelming dominant theoretical function of our mind over the aesthetic function. Unfortunately, the technical spirit or theoretical function of our mind interprets only a very selective view of reality as meaningful. But throughout the entire world, we encounter a re rejection of the reductive functional point of view and a focus on the richness of forms, the abundant traits and the appearance of a living being that lack any direct focus. For Portman, on the other, other hand, this is a crucial moment in the living being's formation. As we summarize, when we look at diversity, the new path of biology, uh, of appearance in a group of related animals, we realize that in addition to structures serving the needs of preservation, there are completely opposing possibilities of free appearance, whose meaning doesn't end with only survival. Looking at these forms, we find that the notion of function that applies to the pattern of preservation can only partially be interpreted through the appearance of living beings. If we were to deal with technically incomprehensible forms, we would not meet only a form and appearance whose technical form we could not grasp functionally, which happens naturally, but also with an infinite number of phenomena that resist this understanding. It's not only cryptic or aposematic, but it's really well, it's ranges of uh, examples from Magnus's work is quite uh, often more fun, but in fact it's really based on a range of the field this phenomenon. The vocabulary of today's neo-Darwinian biology could be described as a neutral mutation, uh, but mostly on, only in theory. When consulting scientific journals, we see an omnipresent search for a functional explanation that each form and behavior have to be explained as an adaptation. In this point, Portman could be compared to French writer and entomologist Roger Caillois, who also emphasized the inability to explain everything by function. Caillois points out to reduction, uh, oh, sorry, that reduction of the objectives of nature based only on suitability is in effect an unacceptable form of anthropocentrism. Caillois appeals to contemplate the possibility of the validity of the existence of aesthetic laws of nature, or laws of spectacular abundance, whose goals we, we, however, do not know. Which is why we can go and compare, for instance, the wings of butterfly to artistic creation. But Roger Caillois speaks directly 
about the uncompromising aesthetic principle. Aesthetics is one of the principles ruling everything living, and is just as <coughs> uncom uncompromising as the law of the function or preservation of species. In this respect, uh, Orban is perhaps more cautious, or rather, the aesthetic dimension of the living beings is part of his wider self presentation efforts of living beings. Uh, they tend to German term uh, hyperterie, creation structures exaggerated towards the goal. Portman, Portman even goes so far in some places to assert that this self presentation prevails over functionality, or it is the actual sense of the living beings. So it is not just some neutral notation or goat's spun rails. Where within the rigid determinism and function there remains a small and marginal space for free creativity. Uh, but it is, according to Otman, more and more obvious that the well-known forms preferred by our technical way of thinking must be considered as a second class. Portman's explanation of the non-deliberate conception of living beings' appearance within the di division of phenomena addressed and unaddressed phenomena is also crucial uh, from a stick point of view. Here, uh, an extra attention should be given to unaddressed phenomena, often complex and aesthetic structures such, for example, these examples of radiator and this medialis <coughs> LG. From Host forms are not determined by the perceiver sensory organs. Of course, from the point of view of biological aesthetics, Portman didn't just answer the question of or whether nature itself tends to create aesthetic, beautiful structures. And here, we should mention not only Kailoa, but more importantly, Ernst Haeckel, who argued that organisms themselves actually matter in general and end up with artistic direction in their own natural ornamental potential originating from the feeling of symmetry. We should also mention other notable figures of German biology, for example, Karl Möbius, or the founder of the mentioned founder, uh, the morphology of plants in Bohemia, Josef Wellenus. At the turn of the 20th century, when these scholars published their works, the aesthetic principle was accepted by them as one of the evolutionary principles. Interestingly, despite all his enthusiasm for natural beauty, Portman never declared and this approach, or even hypothesis, I don't know if it was actually his belief. We talked about this. Uh, for at the time, he didn't dare say aloud, or whether this tendency was simply part of the entire field of the useless forms that nature creates and which humans only perceive and feel as beautiful. We cannot see any such belief in Darwin. Rather, he sees the origin of aesthetic structures through another mechanisms, as we will see. We should also focus on how Darwin perceived the problem of functionality in relation to aesthetic phenomena. Um, after all, Pontman gives the hyperprofile functional approach, and rightly so, in connection with neo-Darwinism or Darwinism. In this context, today's biologists mostly quoted Darwin as the one who combines standard beauty with functionality, mostly in the sense that beauty is functional for males as regards sexual selection. A beautiful appearance is undoubtedly very useful for males and often interpreted in contemporary biology as a sign of fitness, adaptation, good genes, etc. Beauty refers to it simply, as Xenophon Socrates has already suggested, to purposefulness, functionality. There is no beauty without purpose. The beauty and function are compatible. The connection of beauty and functionality in Darwin's work was questioned. Uh, only by his contemporary critics such as John Ruskin, but even contemporary critics from the humanities such as John <coughs> Donald still attribute this approach. But in most examples, and at first glance, Darwin says that beauty really is connected with functionality. He often mentions the beauty of males and its function in sexual selection. But firstly, it is worth worthy not, not nothing as uh, in Stanislav Komarek, or, or later Wolfgang Welsh, point out that Darwin is often skeptical towards the protective warning or communicative function of those vibrant colors in the animals. He often considered that they evolved without their purposes. Uh, we can only say that their bright colors are the result of the chemical structure or tiny composition of the tissue and are not at all connected to any benefit. 
These are not necessarily observed on the invertebrates. At the same time, Darwin gives an example of beautiful red arterial blood, which, however, serves for no purpose. The alluring blush of a girl's face is not only a side effect of, this, of their correlation, but also an effect, effect on other causes. Hemoglobin certainly has a different task than to attract or interest men. Uh, the danger of explaining a beautiful appearance in the terms of functionality regarding also flowers when, for example, Darren writes in a letter to botanist Thomas Meehan. But it is well to remember that their colors may be as important to them as the color of an amethyst or ruby is to these gems. Similarly, uh, he wrote a letter to Wallace, or Fred of Wallace, Wallace, regarding the coloration of a tiger, and he argued against any critic interpretation of it. Secondly, if we take a closer look to Darwin's views on aesthetic issues, we will see that at a last younger age, he consciously con considered beauty to be independent of utility, as he directly expresses in his Voyage of the Beagle. I believe that Wallace and other criticism of Darwin for formulating the theory of sexual selection, including those ideas of female taste, was related precisely to Darwin's abandonment and functional explanation, and thus to the blurring of the anti evolution theory based on survival of the fittest and best adapted. Indeed, for Darwin, sexual selection was an evolutionary principle that often went against natural selection. Of course, not in every case. For example, among mammals, fights between males often lead to the sexual selection of the stronger males. But the structures formed within the framework of sexual selection, mostly in birds, could be disadvantageous in terms of natural selection. Certainly, it is obvious that these structures are useful for the bearers because they will allow them to produce, reproduce. However, it is often forgotten that Darwin faced the question of why females do not choose more visible fit males, those proficient in terms of strength, speed, and so on. Those specimens, who could win the male duel, who can best protect their females, etc. And explicitly big muscular males with no long legs, long teeth. He, uh, he questioned why females choose the beautiful one, however they define it. When given an option, why don't females choose the overly muscular, such as the gorilla silver, silverback, instead being drawn the only skin deep bejeweled beauties, such as the suburb lyre pheasant. Where did this taste emerge? This taste evidently inspired, aspired in creating the structures with human call beautiful, ornamental, decorative, though not very well suited for survival. Darwinists, though not Darwin himself, try to translate beauty into fitness, but aren't able to explain why females don't like self-explanatory fitness and why they choose a much more complicated situation, situation where not only male fitness traits but also female preferences have to be inherited and both traits have to co-evolve. Even if Darwin in his scientific work combines aesthetic issues with the theory of sexual selection and clear utility of functionality, I don't believe that his approach should be reduced to such a concept. The well-known German aesthetician and philosopher Wolfgang Welsh are used in his article about Darwin's aesthetic in the same way. The idea that the sense of beauty arises in a context of utility without it being per se a sense of utility or reducible to utility lies at the heart of Darwin's account of animal aesthetics. Darwin himself put it frankly, the effect of sexual selection, if it appears to be beauty of female enchantment, can only be called useful in a highly and fraught sense. Darwin's ideas about beauty being the driving force behind the frame of sexual selection was formed as part of his quest for the different path of evolution. <coughs> the main evolutionary mechanism, according to him, was natural selection. Yet, sexual selection was also important, even if it sometimes goes against natural selection. Welsh also writes that in Darwin's point of view, sexual selection is a strategy complementary and not reducible to natural selection. Unlike contemporary evolutionary biology, which conceives as a subregion of natural selection, Darwin also, like other biologists of the time, accepted the inheritance of acquired properties, the use and non-use of organs, a law of compensation, balancing of growth, 
etc. Et so if we were to make a sudden simplification, Darwin was much more postmodern than the majority of 20th century biology, trying to translate everything into only one principle. In any case, it might be useful to realize that while Darwin certainly didn't go as far as uh, Paul Martin emphasizing the danger of translating function and purposiveness, he certainly didn't completely turn away from this problem in its relation to aesthetic phenomena in great nature. Subject, uh, chapter, uh, sexual selection and definition of beauty. The fundamental problem or contradiction between our two naturalists begins with their different notions of the field of sexual selection. As we have seen previously, Darwin combines the feeling of beauty with sexual selection and he openly argues <coughs> the ability to perceive this beauty among animals. Although, of course, obviously no animal would be capable of admiring such scenes as the heavens at night, a beautiful landscape, or refined music. But such high tastes are acquired through many culture and depend on complex associations. They are, they, sorry, they are not enjoyed by barbarians or by unadequated persons. As illustrated by Darwin, there is no essential gap between animals and the unadequated members of the human race. Rather, it is a continuous growth in these abilities the broader contents of mental abilities, as we will just see. Darwin's explanation of aesthetic phenomena, respectively with the idea that animals possess states, has failed not only for scholars of the humanities, even the proponents of evolutionary theory have looked at these ideas with skepticism, as mentioned twice. Even the proponents of evolutionary theory have looked at these ideas with skepticism. In fact, Darwin's explanation of the aesthetic structures in animals via female selection was rejected even by Darwinists. Female selection was considered the weakest of all Darwin's ideas. Yet later the reflection on the, this topic has undergone interesting development, both within Darwin and non-Darwin biology. As Helen Connolly pointed out, paradoxically, paradoxically, much of the debate about sexual selection from the 19th century to the present day hasn't been about sexual selection at all, but about natural selection. The, tru the truth is that Portman was aware of this problem and didn't want to reduce it to natural selection. But I am repeatedly surprised by how he completely refuses Darwin's concept of animals having taste. He even explicitly rejects Darwin's hypothesis in particular cases, such as in Neue Wege der Biologie, where he wrote about the peacock tail, which uh, 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 I just mentioned this today. Portman argues that there is no experimental evidence that females make such a choice, but rather they look the other way and focus on the brain on the ground. According to him, the reason behind a peak of sexual display is the ritual behavior of releasing hormones that cause sexual alertness in the female or the sex synchronization of both partners. Similarly, in the Das Tier als Soziale Wesen, he dedicates a whole chapter to the Lyrebird, enthusiastically describing the complexity and splendor of his musical expression and appearance, but his interpretation avoids any female choice. The entire exaggerated tale of the peacock pheasant, as well as the tale of the suitable Lyrebird and his singing, are further evidence to Boltman that such structures go beyond the requirements of sexual selection. But I am afraid he was limited here in the, of the level of knowledge of the time. As Madrid uh, later described, the paradoxical suppression of this viewpoint, which wasn't also absurd at all, after all. For a century after he proposed, uh, he proposed it, Darwin's theory of female choice was ignored, while biologists tied themselves in furious knots to come up with other explanations. Any theory, it seems, was preferred to the idea of female preference for male beauty. Yet it is impossible to watch peacocks displaying and not come away believing that the tale has something to do with the seduction of pheasants. After all, that was how Darwin got the idea in the first place. It wasn't not until 1990s, after years of ignoring Darwin's theory, that biologists began to return to Darwin's original ideas. Level of case of peacock, or also the paradise bird and bower bird, 
typical case, um, if you may really, really choose the, the best bower or best singing, etc., even the younger, uh, younger females uh, prefer um, the bower, but the older females uh, prefer singing and dancing, etc., etc., with different tastes. While the perception of beauty or taste could be discussed, it is evident that in many bird species and mammals too, there is a female who chooses. It is fascinating the complexity of culture behavior or the complexity of structure combined with dance and speech sounds. Um, for example, in power words. Although Portman declares, in connection with the people that are rich in her life, is expressed in its mating ritual. He, in effect, denied maybe this in regards to the fan. Uh, uh, what, what is beauty in, in Darwin and in, 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 um, Portman's work? While I have mentioned aesthetic terms here, we haven't yet dealt much with how both nature interpret that. I haven't found a definition of beauty or aesthetics in Portman. He uses the word beauty in a reference to his personal interest rather than in connection with thinking about appearance. More often, he uses the term aesthetic or aesthetics. He doesn't define it, but he obviously understands it's quite broad. Perhaps it is most used in the previously mentioned article that includes the adjective directed in the title in its title, Biologisches to uh, Aesthetician Erziehung. Uh, Here, the aesthetic function is understood as our ability to grasp the outer world through our senses, the perception of the qualities of forms and lines, colors, sounds, tastes. In opposition to the theoretical function, in which the foundation is, is rational thought, quantification, etc. In Darwin's work, the word aesthetic and aesthetics are almost impossible to find. But he deals with both the traditional concept of beauty and taste, or sense of beauty, typical categories for the 18th century. To a lesser extent, he uses many other English words associated with aesthetic experience like elegance, splendor, luxuriance, grandeur, harmony, decoration, etc. as a delight. 20 of them, maybe. Uh, attractivity. In several places, he also tries to provide a definition of beauty. Here, uh, in short, we can say Darwin sees beauty both in the subjective reaction, pleasure for our senses, and in the properties of, of an aesthetic subject clear, bright colors, variety, symmetry, theorism, characteristic features, a combination of novelty and uniformity. He sees the root of aesthetic pleasure in physiology in the properties of our senses. Um, I have five or ten minutes. <coughs> <laughs> there is no time for longer analysis. Uh, Darren's back definition is an expected synthesis of the 18th century British tradition and more positivist approaches of naturalism in the second half of the 19th century. Darwin defines beauty as a pleasure based on sensory perception, on objective existing qualities or of perceived objects, as opposed to the symbolism <coughs> of the 18th century, emphasizing the separated of the train of association of our mind, uh, of the qualities of objects. So he uses the inspiration from physiology, from Edmund etc., from Helmholtz, uh, he was all the, the authors. Both Darwin and Portman agree about the emphasis on, on symmetry, which is moreover very characteristic of attempts to explore att attractiveness and beauty in contemporary biology. It, in this respect, this is quite surprising the resignation of the argument that began in modern times, especially by Berg, but also by Kant, which meant a relatively radical breakout philosophical aesthetics which attempts to find a connection between beauty and symmetry, regularity, utility and perfection. This wasn't only Baer, but also Schiller and also Immanuel Kahn. Uh, pro, uh, uh, properties that seem to depend on reason, on what we would call uh, that symmetry is based on reason, sense, uh, not in our emotions, on what we could call with Portman the theoretical function of our mind, not on our emotion emotionality. And so 
feeling of beauty. So we could see the emergence of a paradox. On the one hand, Portman, we also Darwin, constantly law talks about the appearance of living beings not so subordinated to any function or adaptation, and at the same time avoids the argument similar to Kant's, working with the terms such as this disinterested liking, delight in purposiveness without purpose, etc. The more narrowly defined aesthetic area of the modern era quite often often considered cement as something irrelevant or even devaluing for an aesthetic experience. During the second half of the 18th century, when philosophical aesthetics developed, it was precisely nature, often imagined in as a wide landscape such as mountains, waterfalls and forests, that was superior to human art because it was independent of regularity, symmetry and so on. It is a bit, uh, bit surprising to me what would be more appropriate to support Portman's approach than Kant's purposiveness without purpose. This kind of uh, landscape. Uh, but then, I hope it will be a, a, a stress Last paragraph. Uh, I want more space in the collective paragraphs. That there are really quite interesting topics connected with aesthetics. Uh, the, mainly the, uh, the Portman's uh, accent on the <coughs> difference between outside and inside, uh, which is, I suppose, not very. Often in Darwin, uh, with the exception of uh, his work, uh, expression of emotions. And there will be also an interesting comparison of Portman and Darwin's views on the hierarchy of living beings. Basically, a very respectable theme following on uh, Scala Nature within the field of natural philosophy. For Portman, the problem of rank was absolutely essential. While Darwin was aware of the hierarchy of organisms, the superiority of mental abilities or others, he was also a supporter of the lower forms and expressly talks about the effort to rise or elevate lower forms to the, into the higher forms, although his most famous and essential works contain thousands of examples from all possible levels of possible hierarchy, his attentive research was focused primarily on lower forms. See his crucial works about Bernacles. Uh, Tripedia, experiments with earthworms, bees, his book on carnivorous plants, etc. Likewise, in this transition between humans and animals, he always emphasized the gradual tradition and even the decline taste of the primitive man. From a current political correctness perspective, he was very dismissive about them, mainly due to his negative experience with the indigenous people of the Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and the uh, uh, important topic would be also uh, art and art theory uh, in Darwin, in Portland. Both of them dealt with uh, art theory in a very, very, very interesting way. So, so maybe short stress and conclusion. Uh, so, um, I think that in some respects we can find a surprising consensus between Portman and Darwin that the appearance of living beings cannot be reduced to the result of adaptations within natural selection. In this, both of them deviate from later neo darwinism Nevertheless, it must be stressed that Portman's opinion on the non purposive origin of the forms is definitely stronger. Likewise, both agree that we cannot reduce animals to mere mindless mechanisms. Darwin constantly emphasized the animal psyche. It is no coincidence that he wrote an entire work on emotions and sees the transition between animals and humans as continuing. Portman emphasized a complex and complicated inwardness, and while he draws attention to the richness of this inwardness, he quite clearly sees the difference between humans and animals. This is perhaps one of the reasons, or many implications, for the vastly different interpretation of aesthetic phenomena in nature. For Darwin, it is sexual selection, above all, in which such structures root, complemented by other evolutionary processes, 
such as the law of comp uh, compensation or balancing of growth to co-evolution in insects and pollinated plants, or, or of course just coincident in natural selection, semantic structures, etc. In the context of sexual selection, it is a sense of beauty or taste inherent in females that influences the male form, the species form, and cons uh, consequently its entire species to evolve often in a direction going against the direction of natural selection. In contrast, Portman quite opposes this hypothesis and explains a number of phenomena in both behavior and external structures as part of a requisite uh, synchronization of part. He emphasizes that the substantial part of appearance and behavior doesn't have any direct function. It's actually a self-presentation of the species <coughs> and the individual. Basically, what we would call an aesthetic structure is only one of the facets of this self-presentation. However, both naturalists emphasize the symmetry of living beings as part of what led to an aesthetic appreciation of their appearance. This is an explicit part of Darwin's definition of beauty, some kind of biological constant. With this, both agree with contemporary neo Darwinists. Neither Portman nor Darwin focuses on the aesthetic preferences of the landscape. Though Darwin was an enthusiastic devotee of landscape beauty of the late age, uh, till the late age, and there are numerous reflections on the subject in his travel writings, he didn't input any hypothesis about in his scientific work, about this in his scientific work. These steps have caused his later followers in the natural sciences, such as Aldo Leopold, to combine the beauty of the landscape with biodiversity, Conrad Lorenz, linked an increasing appreciation of landscapes and organisms with their growing complexity, and the entire avalanche of works following Appleton's experience of landscape, 1975, combined the aesthetic pleasure of the landscape with the Darwinian roots of our responses to a specific habitat. Last paragraph. As we have heard from her, uh, both natures took an interest in our, uh, Darwin involved this interest into this reflection on the biological origins of art among different animal species and man. Art, according to him, is an instinctive trap. In opinion, we will also find in a number of recent publications like Dennis Dutton, Dissanaya, etc. Portman uses the examples from art to disbelieve the strictly <laughs> function. Although they might disagree in some ways, I believe that their views, albeit sometimes from different angles, are opposed to later now gardens. In any case, both Portman and Darwin attempt to return to play the aesthetic dimension of nature, which is still deserving of our attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karel. And now, time for questions. So I might start with the first one. Uh, that's at first like no at first, but for this time I will I will uh, hold the strict Portman in line, and I think that the interpretation of the ritual making ritual of people is different than what you put forward. I think Portman also say that there is form which is the primary. And so there is a lot of emotions going on. If there is the uh, male peacock displaying the feathers, and if there are females around and choosing with the bus. But this isn't explanation for the origination of the form. So, like he would say, okay, we still need to say why it appeared in the evolution that there is such a complex form. Afterwards, of course, like we can see some mediation by natural selection, but it's not the explanation for the origin. What do you see? Maybe maybe you are right, but uh, still I suppose it's a bit strange that he directly rejects uh, the the idea of female status. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think you I, I suppose it's, it's no word about it. 
uh, and he even said, I, I don't know if it's uh, in Neue uh, Welt, that you will be a peacock tail, or it's a liar bird, in many rare chapter in uh, here as Luciale Pleasant, as well. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's it in this or this chapter, but uh, what? he, he was dark and said, it is not the female she chooses. I think he actually does because he has the argument with Albino people. Yeah, yeah. And he says that uh, actually females sometimes prefer the Albino ones which do not have colorful feathers. So, in his sense, it, in, in his interpretation, it's hard to keep that uh, the origination of the colorfulness is from sexual selection if Albino peacocks are quite successful. So, I don't think that he dismissed it. Uh, like plainly, but he he doesn't like to see it as one of the crucial selective forces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, of course, uh, he tries to explain the growth of forms in another way. Right. So, yes. yes. Or uh, yeah. So maybe short notes. Uh, also, some experiments with. Takes this uh, of forms which are not present in, in animals, so maybe uh, 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 it was just the case of Magnus' uh, butterflies. The, the, the preferences of females mm -hmm. are a bit different than, than the real form, uh, but it's experimentally uh, visible. Choose when would be uh, the chance uh, to have this, this form. Or the same as in fishes and zebra finches, and, uh, it's, it's a bit different. What about the cross selection of the girls' uh, cases? Well, but it's the same, yeah. It's different, different tastes doesn't exist in, yes. in, in forms. Some more questions. So maybe he will respond in his talk directly. So thank you, Carlos.